Did. So uh, this afternoon's uh, lecture is going to be on what I've loosely titled uh, Advanced SANS Methods. Um, this is essentially divided into uh, four different categories um, and is, is really talking about methods that go beyond the standard um, type of SANS instrument that we've been talking about so far. So here we're talking about being able to measure larger structures than a, a typical SANS instrument can measure, being able to measure surface structures, um, looking at how structure evolves with time, uh, and also then um, uh, not uh, working in inverse space, but making measurements that are more directly related to uh, real space structures but at the same time, still using small angle scattering. All right, so if we start with measuring larger structures, um, we want to be able to uh, configure a SANS instrument to measure larger objects, right? So, so what can we do, uh, thinking back to the lecture I gave yesterday about how we set up SANS, uh, SANS instruments and what you've had today about doing experiments, what can we do with a SANS instrument to allow us to measure larger sizes? Anybody have any thoughts? What, what things can we do to measure bigger things? Have a very large sample to detector distance. Yes, that's one option, yep. Any other thoughts? And increasing the Q, it was uh, lower, um, with lower velocity neutrons. Yeah, so exactly. So using uh, using um, uh, slower, longer wavelength neutrons yes. to, to get to to get to lower Q values. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so we we essentially therefore have um, uh, what it, it amounts to is um, three different options. Right. We can increase the distance for a given beam size. So we, we set our collimation such that we don't change the actual size of the of the of the beam. Uh, and increase L2, or we can uh, decrease the beam size. So remember, we can make the aperture smaller. So that makes the beam size smaller whilst keeping L2 constant. So that gives us a smaller angle as well. Uh, or we can increase the wavelength at some given setting of the instrument. So uh, if we look at this, then we have these three options, right? So we could uh, calculate the uh, required L2 to reach uh, three times 10 to the minus five inverse angstroms uh, using neutrons at a typical high intensity wavelength for a, a reactor, so four angstroms. Um, we could choose to say, right, we want to get down to a very low Q. So one times 10 to the minus five inverse angstroms, that gets us down to something on the order of uh, 10 microns in size. So um, what would it take uh, to get to um, uh, that with a wavelength of four angstroms? Uh, and also what would be the minimum accessible Q under circumstances like this, which are perhaps typical of a, a long SANS instrument, if we use a, a wavelength of 20 angstroms. Uh, and so we can calculate these using a fairly straightforward uh, set of combinations. We know what, how to calculate Q. Uh, we know the relationship between the beam size and uh, the distance uh, here and, and this angle. And that's really the minimum, essentially we can take that as our minimum scattering angle, the edge of the beam stop or the edge of the make direct beam. And so we can calculate uh, any of these terms given the other, the other components. And what we find, right, if we go ahead and calculate this for these, these conditions, um, what we find is that uh, here, if we want to be able to get down to these three times 10 to the minus five inverse angstroms, so this is uh, order a micron in size, using four angstrom neutrons, we end up with an L2 that's 654 meters. That's quite long. Um, and so what might be the problems associated with having such a long secondary flight path? I remember that the, the primary flight path would be essentially the same. So this will be a 1.2 kilometer long instrument. So aside from building, one. Can you think of any physics reasons why this might be a problem? 
could it be that uh, neutrons like start to deviate a bit from the top? Yes, exactly. Yes. So neutrons have mass uh, and they are moving at, uh, at normal velocity, so to speak. Um, and so they are affected by and they are affected by gravity. And so the neutrons would actually be as they're leaving the end of your leaving your sample, they're actually mostly traveling in parabolic paths. Um, and so neutrons would all, would basically have hit the floor before they ever got anywhere close to the detector. And in fact, on the long sands instrument at ILL, D11, just a secondary flight path of only 40 meters, uh, already neutrons at reasonable wavelengths are hitting the bottom of the detector rather than the middle. And so gravity is real and, uh, and affects neutrons. The other issue is that in order to, to do this, we end up with a very uh, low flux because of the, the narrow divergence that we, the narrow angle range that we have to have. So we end up with very few neutrons. So not only do, do they hit the floor, but only not very many of them actually made it to our sample in the first place. In the second case, we can say, well, okay, we, we need to keep it at 30 meters. So what do we do if we just make the beam size smaller? Um, so this now means that if we go to our optimum setting of matched collimation, 30 plus 30, uh, and uh, having the, the uh, second, having the sample aperture half the size of the uh, source aperture, uh, we end up with a sample aperture of um, just under uh, one millimeter. Uh, and this is very small, right? And so again, we come up against the issue of flux and the number of neutrons that we're able to actually get through our sample. Um, and because we've gone for this matched collimation, uh, we actually uh, lose neutrons uh, in, is, as, a, as the, you know, the square of the diameter uh, twice. twice. And so we use, lose an awful lot of neutrons in this. Um, and then we say, well, okay, what's, what could we do if we had a set normal SANS instrument with a sensibly sized beam? Um, so we have a reasonable number of neutrons, but then we go to uh, the longest reasonable wavelength we might get off a SANS instrument. Uh, in general, because uh, the flux from uh, the source of neutrons drops off uh, with lambda to the minus five in a, in a Maxwell in a Boltzmann distribution, um, we lose neutrons very quickly. Uh, this is somewhat compensated by the fact that uh, the scattered intensity goes roughly as uh, lambda to the three. So we end up with a, um, a sort of lambda to the minus two or so uh, change in intensity as, as we go. So we don't lose as much as we might. But fundamentally, we're still limited by the number of neutrons that come out. And 20 angstroms is about the, the maximum that you can realistically use on any SANS instrument. And with a normal sized SANS instrument, we simply can't get down to the uh, length scales that we want to get to, the, the Q values we want to get to, to get to the large length scales that might be interesting. So you can imagine, for instance, the type of systems I'm talking about here are you want to study emulsion droplets, uh, you want to be able to measure both the structure of the interface and the droplet size distribution. Um, there, you need to go into the, the micrometer range, um, uh, uh, just as an example. And so, so we have, um, uh, or if you're interested in alloys, if you want to look at the grain structure size, that goes into the micron range. Uh, if you're interested in geological samples, they have a lot of structure in the micron range and so on. Um, but this still doesn't get us there, and we've had to throw away a lot of neutrons to, to, to even not get to the Q, Q we wanted to get to. But we do make measurements um, on these very low uh, Q values and at very uh, uh, so larger structures with SANS. So, so how do we do it? Well, there are a number of different options. Um, the, the One of the first ones that was done was actually uh, use uh, lenses to focus uh, the neutron beam. Um, this allows us to uh, increase the flux for those cases where we had a very small um, uh, beam size. We effectively can multiply up the, the number of neutrons we get. Uh, and uh, the next method that became popular was what we call USANS, which is ultra small angle scattering or ultra high resolution small angle neutron scattering, depending on how you count it. Um, and this uses a totally different design of instrument to achieve those very uh, small uh, Q values. And you can see this is the method we use to get down to the very lowest Q. And then there's another method that's come along in the last decade or so called vSANS, um, uh, which is sans uh, imaginatively for very small angle neutron scattering. Uh, 
Um, and this is another method of multiplexing beams to allow us to get, again, increase the flux we get whilst having very small beam sizes. So how do these all work? So one of the nice things about neutrons is the fact that they essentially behave like electromagnetic radiation. We can, uh, we can diffract them, uh, refract them, uh, focus them and reflect them, right? Um, and so uh, we can take uh, lenses that have, uh, are made of a material that uh, has a suitable um, uh, refractive index, so suitable scattering and density, um, in this case, magnesium fluoride is, the, is the, uh, usually the material of choice. Um, and we can then work out um, uh, how many lenses we need and where we need to put them. And so for instance, here's an example. Uh, we might want to focus eight angstrom neutrons. It's easier generally to focus longer uh, wavelength neutrons. So uh, you pick somewhere where the, you still have enough of them. Um, and then we have a certain radius of curvature and then we have a settings, uh, a fixed set settings for our um, instrument. And then we can work out how many lenses we need. Um, and unfortunately, unlike light uh, and, and actual electromagnetic radiation, um, neutrons still interact fairly weakly with materials. So the amount we can bend a neutron beam is actually quite small uh, using these types of methods. So we end up needing quite a large stack of lenses to be able to focus the beam over these distances. Uh, and so actually we end up with uh, a stack of uh, lenses of uh, 36, a 30 stack of 36 lenses uh, with a focal length of uh, six meters, six and a bit meters. And there are various different calculations you can do to determine uh, exactly for your given configuration of instrument what the, the lenses uh, are needed. And these are used at a number of reactor sources to be able to achieve uh, lower Q values uh, whilst increasing the intensity of the beam. The key thing to note here is the fact that what we're doing, in fact, is focusing at the sample in this case. Uh, we're not focusing on the um, uh, uh, detector, okay? So the beam size at the detector um, is actually uh, not as uh, small as it would be if we didn't have the lenses, but is still smaller than it would be um, to achieve the same uh, minimum view. So it's a complicated set of, of combinations of factors. So another way of getting to lower Q is to use vSANS. Uh, and essentially what this is, is this is a series of uh, pinholes um, that are uh, aligned such that we get a whole set of independent SANS instruments effectively, all converging to the same spot on the detector. Um, and so by, by doing so, we end up multiplying up the number of, of beams we have uh, and essentially focusing them uh, in space uh, it, so that they all hit the detector at the same point. Um, this actually requires us to have a larger sample than normal to be able to make most of it. Um, but uh, allows us to achieve um, much higher fluxes than we could for such tiny pinholes. Um, and so in practice, what this looks like is you have, instead of a single aperture, you put in a uh, plate with many apertures on, um, and um, uh, you calculate exactly the series of uh, many sets of these apertures you need to prevent crosstalk so that there's only one path for any given set of neutrons. Um, and um, uh, you also then uh, need a set of lenses uh, to remove, to make sure you're uh, uh, removing distortions, some prisms to uh, counteract gravity. Um, and these all need to be nitrogen cooled. Um, and then uh, they eventually uh, uh, can hit the um, uh, detector in the same place. Um, there was an instrument at the Helmholtz Center in Berlin, which closed in 2019, uh, that did this, although it was not very often used. Um, the only instrument currently operating and uh, with, with potentially having this set up is the vSANS instrument at NIST. And even then, actually, they're only operating with converging slits rather than converging pinholes uh, at the moment, because aligning these pinholes is extremely difficult. 
Um, the SANS instrument under development and being built at the Chinese Spallation Neutron Source will also make use of this method to get to much lower Q. And uh, the SCADI instrument being built here at ESS uh, will use a similar system, but it will actually use um, slit collimators in a different design to be able to, to also reach a much smaller Q values. And the last example of getting down to really very low Q is a completely different design of instrument. This isn't an add-on to a existing uh, SANS instrument. Um, this is a U SANS instrument, and it's what is known as a Bonse Hart uh, type of diffractometer. It's a double crystal diffractometer, basically. So what we have is we have the neutrons coming out of the reactor. Ooh. We have the neutrons coming out of the reactor. By the way, can you all see my mouse pointer? Yes. Yes, good. Uh, we have uh, the neutrons coming out of the reactor here. They pass through some filters. Remember, we talked about filters the other day. These remove un un unwanted wavelengths uh, that we, we don't want for our experiment. We have a curved graphite um, um, pre-monochromator here. So this um, both focuses uh, the beam and also uh, provides some degree of monochromation. Again, we talked about monochromators. And then here we have a pair of silicon uh, crystals. And these are actually single crystals of silicon, about so big, that are, have a channel cut into it and then uh, are made into three blades. And the key point here is that these are all uh, from the same crystal, right? So the um, crystal planes in all of those blades are perfectly aligned, even if the mechanically the surfaces aren't. So we can cut the, uh, the a ball of silicon in the right way. Uh, so now we would have uh, this silicon 111 um, uh, uh, crystal plane or another choice 220 or something like this, depending upon uh, the, the wavelength you want. Um, and then, so the beam comes in, it hits one part of the monochromator, is diffracted, hits another part of the monochromator, is diffracted again, hits another part of the monochromator and is diffracted again. And so now through this diffraction, we've done two things. We have uh, selected the wavelength we want um, very precisely, but also because it's a single crystal, um, the uh, angular range over which the uh, Bragg condition is met is very narrow. And so we've not only chosen the wavelength we want very precisely, but we've also chosen the angular spread of the beam very precisely in the, in the diffraction plane. We then pass this through our sample, and then we have an analyzer crystal. And if this analyzer crystal and this monochromator crystal are perfectly aligned, then only neutrons that have not been scattered uh, will be diffracted again and reach the detector. What we can then do is we can rotate this crystal by a very small amount and not a few micro radians. Um, and then we now are only uh, neutrons that have been scattered by that angle will now meet the Bragg condition. And by scanning that analyzer, we're now scanning through scattering angle and thus scanning through Q space. And we can do this with very fine precision and get very, very small angles of measurement. Um, this in fact was the instrument that I used to be responsible for when I, when I worked at NIST before I, uh, before I came here. Um, and so this means we can now get down to these extremely small Q values, as well as going up and overlapping with the measurements we can make with a regular SANS instrument. Um, this sounds fairly wonderful, but there are some caveats. One, it's because it's a scanning technique, then uh, time resolved measurements are difficult. Also, the flux of neutrons is very low because we have so narrowly defined uh, the wavelength and divergence. So you remember I mentioned when I was talking about using crystals as monochromators, that one of the problems was it really cut down the flux. Well, it absolutely does here. And so a measurement that uh, might take eight hours uh, to make uh, on this instrument for one sample uh, to scan over a, a relatively uh, from say 10 to, three 10 to the minus five out to 10 to the minus uh, three even, not even out to 10 to the minus two uh, inverse angstroms. Um, and so it's much slower. So time resolved measurements are, uh, are rather out of the question. Um, the other challenge is that um, these are channel cut crystals, right? So they have diffraction in this direction. And so they're narrowing the divergence in this direction, but there's no diffraction in, in the vertical direction. 
Um, and so the, the divergence in the vertical direction is very wide. And so in effect, what we're doing here is if you imagine this plot, these circles are constant Q contours. So we're going out here, this is a Q value, this is a Q value, this is a Q value, and it's the same all the way around. Um, you know, the vector changes, but the magnitude is the same. Um, for any given setting of our analyzer, we're looking at some Q value in this horizontal direction. Uh, and we have very good resolution in this direction, right? This is due to our diffraction and, and, and beam spread. However, in the other direction, we have essentially very poor resolution. Uh, you can see that it, the resolution is on the order of 0.1 inverse angstroms. And that's much, much, many orders of magnitude higher than what we're measuring. And this has a significant effect on how the data looks uh, on the resolution of the measurement. And so here we have uh, the form factor for a sphere. Uh, and this is what the same thing would look like if we measured it on the USANS instrument. Um, but we know this. And so when we analyze the data, we can take our model, uh, apply this resolution function to it, uh, and fit the data directly. Um, and we can use the resolution function for the SANS uh, instrument uh, in the same way and, and co-analyze co SANS and USANS data. Um, and so we can still extract information across a very wide Q range. But this has to be borne in mind when you're thinking about the analysis of such an instrument. And the same is true for uh, slit vSANS. That also has a, a slit geometry, which gives uh, this very asymmetric resolution function, which causes uh, some odd effects to, to the data that you have to take into account when you're analyzing it. All right. So that's covering all the different ways that we can measure much bigger things out to order 10 microns or so, uh, where we're starting then to overlap with microscopy techniques. So now uh, you have a method where you could do microscopy, uh, some light scattering maybe, uh, and then we do some neutrons and x-rays. You can do USACs as well. Um, and then SANS and SACs, uh, and then on into the diffraction regime maybe even. So with the combination of techniques, we can actually measure very wide, very wide Q ranges and size ranges indeed. But what if we want to measure surface structures? So um, in general, SANS can provide you with information about the bulk structure in plane, depend if you set the geometry up correctly, uh, and has uh, quite a strong penetration depth if you don't restrict the beam size. Um, whereas reflectometry uh, provides information only in the, um, uh, generally only in the uh, plane perpendicular to the surface. Uh, and that uh, is usually limited to a few hundred nanometers of depth of information. So how can we measure the in-plane structure of uh, thin films? Well, one way is just to make a lot of thin films, right? So get enough material in the beam so that we get a scattering signal. So if we, this is fairly common, if you're interested in the in-plane structure of films, you make a whole bunch of, of silicon wafers, put films on all of them, stack them up, put them in the beam, uh, and, um, uh, and look at the in-plane structure, right? Because then you're just doing a standard transmission measurement, just limited to thin films. Um, this is actually very straightforward, um, aside from necessarily making films that are the same uniform across each sample. But um, the problem is here that ideally we have several micron thick films. So that if that's the type of films you're talking about, that's great. Um, but you're really not looking at the near surface region then, right? You're, you're well away from any surface effects once you're into the micron sizes. Um, and you may need many wafers. Uh, and potentially the background from the substrate can be significant. So here, this is where thinking about doing some deuteration schemes and things to enhance the contrast in your sample uh, would end up being necessary if that's possible for the, for the sample. Um, the other thing is to do a reflectometry experiment. Um, in, uh, in, if you have a two-dimensional detector on your reflectometry instrument, um, then in general, you will uh, see um, uh, scattering that happens off the specular uh, direction, uh, which we refer to uh, very imaginatively as off specular reflectivity. Um, in general, because of the choice of collimation in a reflectometry experiment and so on, um, what we can do is we can probe uh, 
sort of micrometer length scale structures in the direction of the beam, right? So, um, uh, but we, we get, because of the width of the beam we use for reflectometry, we get no information uh, in the, uh, the Y direction, uh, which is uh, along the surface perpendicular to the beam. Um, and uh, so, so we can use this off-specular structure. And in fact, actually this off-specular scattering is often uh, assumed to mostly be a background signal that you want to subtract from your specular reflectivity. And so actually re regularly uh, we will use the area next to the specular ridge in a picture like this as a definition of our background signal. But in fact, if there is structure, there will be information in this. Um, the other option is to do what's known as grazing incident sands or GI sands or G sands, depending upon, uh, or G sands, depending upon your uh, choice of, uh, of acronym and language. Um, there are two different regimes we should sort of, we have to sort of consider here. One is what I call true G sands. Uh, this is where the incoming neutrons are at an angle below the critical angle, right? So, uh, so here you're essentially in the total reflection regime. Uh, and so you only have um, uh, evanescent wave scattering um, from the interfacial region. Uh, this is extremely weak. The intensity of the waves does decays exponentially through the surface. And this is done really well with X-rays. Um, but again, because we have many, many orders of magnitude, fewer neutrons, uh, and the neutrons interact more weakly, uh, this means that this evanescent wave is, is actually a very weak, um, uh, gives a very weak signal and it's very difficult to get anything off this. So more often what we do is we do what we call near surface sands, which often is the bulk of what we call G sands most of the time. Here we put our incoming neutrons at an angle that's a bit greater than the critical angle. Then we have a refractive way, ray, a wave that is refracted into the surface and is then scattered from a region below the interface. And then depending on how we set up the equipment, we deter and what wavelength we choose, then the penetration and scattering volume uh, can be varied. This is actually, as I said, the significant cause of background in reflectometry experiments and is most of what is measured as, as off specular scattering as well. So uh, how do we set up these measurements? Well, basically what we have to do is we have to take now a pinhole beam uh, so we narrow the, the beam in the Y direction. So we essentially take a sands, in, sands beam and we incline it at a small angle um, and, put, and pinch it onto the surface of a sample and then look at the, uh, the reflected pattern. Um, and so now what we have is we have uh, probing in one direction, the QY space, uh, which is in this direction, and in the other direction, the reflectometry space. So essentially we can imagine that we have uh, for a given instance, we have a specular spot, which is where the direct beam goes, and everything else is off specular scattering, either in uh, the, the one plane or the other. And the shape of this pattern uh, then tells us about the in-plane structure. However, the analysis of this is not so simple. We have to deconvolute lots of geometry effects from uh, the sample, uh, and also then uh, come up with a modeling regime uh, to be able to model this, this structure. Um, and this is, uh, uh, can be rather challenging, in fact. The other thing to bear in mind is also that the penetration uh, depth of neutrons is both angle dependent and wavelength dependent. Um, and so um, by, by changing that, we, we can either use that to control what, what part of the, of the sample we're looking at, or we can uh, just need to know it so that we know what part of the sample we're probing when we're doing our, our modeling and data analysis. And then again, below the angle of total reflection, only an evanescent wave uh, penetrates the surface. Um, and so here you can see, uh, as we um, uh, increase our wavelength, um, then we become uh, uh, going from being bulk sensitive uh, to being surface sensitive, uh, as we're also looking at uh, different uh, angles. Uh, and here's an example of uh, how we can do this. Uh, particularly, this is, might be of interest at ESS using a high intensity time of flight polychromatic beam. Uh, we can get over some of the challenges that you face with monochromatic instruments. Uh, 
we will have many more neutrons, and we can make use of the time of flight information to probe multiple depths simultaneously. Um, here's an example of, uh, from the literature of uh, using time of flight uh, grazing instant scattering uh, to look at uh, polymer, the structure of polymer nanodot films on a surface. And here, uh, taking different wavelengths allowed to probe different uh, parts of the structure. The real advantage here by, for neutrons because you might say, well, why can't we just do this with mic microscopy or AFM or something like this? Um, well, the answer is that it is for looking at buried or magnetic interfaces, right? So if we have a surface that is a, a patterned surface underneath another surface, then the penetration of neutrons allows us to look at that. And we can make use of the magnetic um, interactions of the neutron uh, to get magnetic information about the surface in plane as well as uh, normal to it. Okay, so um, we've talked about uh, how to measure smaller structures, how to measure surface structures, uh, and both of these essentially required uh, new types of instrument. Um, uh, okay, sorry, I had an, uh, there was a, there was a question from uh, Jinshan before I go on to the next one. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, the depth gradient of hydrogen and metals, I would say it's, it's uh, most likely to be either reflectometry uh, or one of the um, uh, neutron depth profiling methods that actually aren't so much scattering. They, they rely on looking at things like um, depth sensitive gamma spectra and things like this. Um, but, um, but there are good methods. I think reflectometry might be a, be a good choice if you can get sufficiently smooth surfaces uh, to be able to measure. And depending on whether you want to go beyond uh, maybe 100 nanometers, if you, if you need deeper information than that, it becomes uh, a, a grazing instance problem and then, then it gets uh, a, a perhaps more difficult depending on the structure of the metal or alloy. All right. So the, what I said before was that we needed specific, uh, mostly specific instrumentation uh, to measure those, uh, those types of structures. To measure time-dependent structures, there are some things we can do just with existing SANS instruments, um, but there are some examples where some, we can get additional information if we can make uh, design our instruments in a certain way. So at its simplest, time is old SANS uh, on the second to minute time scale or even the sub-second time scale these days um, is reasonably strong, then we can do this with uh, sequential methods. So basically uh, just starting off the reaction or the impetus or whatever, or the, what we want to do to our, our sample, and then just measuring uh, time shots, or in the case of event data, recording event data over time and slicing it up afterwards uh, into the time slots we want. Um, and an example of, of how one can do this uh, is, uh, for instance, this these measurements that were made on lipid transfer between nano disks. So here, what they did was they mixed um, some deuterated uh, lipid nano disks and some protonated lipid nano disks in a ratio such that when the lipids were perfectly mixed, they would be contrast matched with the solvent. Uh, and so what happens over time is that the lipids transfer uh, between the two populations. And so if you just measure uh, the total scattered intensity as a function of time, you get a measure of how fast the lipids are moving back and forth. And so you can see this was done on time scales up to 10 seconds. Uh, and because we, it was, we're well, not we, and because they were just counting uh, total intensity rather than having to look at the actual scattering pattern, uh, this could get actually quite good, um, uh, good signal uh, in short uh, time measurements. But as you can see, as we get up to uh, biological, uh, towards biological temperatures, the rate becomes so fast that it becomes increasingly difficult to measure. And so here, this is where having instruments that had more neutrons and have a setup to measure and even faster time scales would be useful. Um, other options we can do are to do things such as uh, standard samples, such as stopped flow or flow through mixing. So in the case of stopped flow, what you do is you rapidly mix uh, in a chamber um, uh, two solutions, and then you uh, can uh, uh, take me quick measurements uh, 
Um, and the mixing time uh, determines the, uh, the time of uh, your capture of the uh, measurement. So here you have to do this over and over again uh, in order to build up enough statistics, but you can measure whole scattering curves. And so here, these were uh, 50 to 100 millisecond uh, measurements that were repeated uh, up to 25 times in order to get enough statistics. But still then using this method, you could look at the structural transition of, uh, in this case, mixing two surfactants. So they went from a disc to a vesicle uh, structure. Another option is if you want to look at reactive systems is to use flow through mixing. Here, basically, you start them reacting and they pass along uh, a small capillary. Um, and because they're reacting as time goes by, where you look at the sample as it's flowing through also corresponds to uh, reaction time. So if you close, look close to the mixing chamber, then what you're looking at is short reaction times. If you're looking further away, you're looking at longer reaction times and the flow rate uh, can be used to also control exactly where in the reaction time you're looking at. Um, and so these, uh, these types of methods can be used um, to, to look at short time scale uh, measurements without having to modify the instrument itself. You're just changing in both cases here, the sample environment that you put on the instrument. Um, another way to do this is for instance, to do stroboscopic um, type measurements where, uh, and these are often used with uh, shear, so you'll put a rheometer or a shear cell uh, into the instrument, uh, and you will then uh, do, uh, put your sample under some sort of uh, shear field, stop the shear, let it relax and take measurements, and you have a triggering system whereby the cycle of the um, uh, rheometer is linked up to the uh, data collection on the uh, SANS instrument, uh, and so you can then again, uh, just go through this cycle uh, repeatedly um, and build up the statistics based upon where exactly in this relaxation curve or uh, ex excitation curve you were. And this is uh, shown as an example for um, shear, but one can do it things like with UV illumination, for instance, for light switchable uh, surfactants or polymers, uh, you can uh, turn on a light, turn off a light, uh, you can uh, apply uh, electric fields or magnetic fields in similar ways um, and look at the response of your system uh, to, to this by repeatedly going over. Of course, this only works if you have a reversible change and you're interested in that reversibility. Um, however, the, um, the minimum time scale that you can measure is limited by the range of wavelengths you have. And in the case of um, uh, a time of flight in instrument is limited by the pulse length, which gives the, the range of wavelengths you have. Um, and so uh, there's, oh, there's a sh for a typical um, continuous source SANS instrument, you have a resolution for these type of uh, cyclical measurements of something on the order of about 50 milliseconds. Um, and uh, so if we, uh, uh, so this is basically just limited by the time it takes different uh, neutron wavelengths to get to the same point on the detector. Um, there was this method invented by Roland Gehler at ILL, which he called TISAN, um, which uh, uh, is, uh, stands for Time Involved Small Angle Neutron Experiments. Uh, but also is very similar to the Swedish word for a herbal infusion. Um, that's not the Swedish word, the French word for herbal infusion. Dear me, I'm in the wrong country. Um, and what you do here, though, is actually you put a chopper at the source and then you uh, synchronize the chopper with what you're doing to your sample. Uh, and what this then means is that uh, neutrons that arrive at the same time were actually scattered at the same time in the sample response curve. Um, it's rather complicated. Um, and actually this type of method to a limited extent can be done automatically at a time of flight instrument because you know when any given wavelength passed through the sample because you know where it was at any given time. So if you know that the neutron reached your detector at X time and you know when it started, 
you know when it hit your sample. And so you can know, then find out what state your sample was in when, say, 10 angstrom neutrons went through. Um, and this is more or less the same, but with uh, significantly more flexibility in the fact that you can get very high frequencies out of this that you can't get out of a, a time of flight source. So this technique is available at the ILL and NCNR and has mostly been applied so far to things like the behavior of ferrofluids, the type of fluids that are used in these fancy um, adjustable um, uh, dampers for, uh, for expensive cars, where by changing the magnetic field, you can change the viscosity of uh, the, rea the, the rheological properties and the viscosity of the uh, ferrofluid and change its, its dampener. But understanding the critical behavior of these uh, has been done uh, primarily using Riosans. Uh, sorry, using um, tisane. Um, there haven't been many other examples of using this because it is generally focused on very high frequency uh, uh, effects. All right, so, um, so now we've spoken about how we can do time resolved measurements. Um, I want to go on to perhaps what is the uh, most different uh, method. So far, all of the things we've done look like SANS instruments one way or another. Um, this example now where we measure in real space, I'm going to talk now about a technique we call spin echo sands. All right, so um, the ability of a regular pinhole sands instrument allows us to measure in the nanometer to 500 nanometer regime, and we have relatively long instruments and we measure in reciprocal space. The technique of spin echo sands um, which I'll describe in a moment, uh, makes you is, is able to measure uh, from uh, something like 30 or so nanometers, but goes up well into the uh, range that we're talking about with USANs uh, at 20 micrometers. The instruments are much more compact. And importantly, uh, one of the things they do is that they give you a scattering curve that is related directly to real space distances, is not in reciprocal space. And this can be an advantage uh, in understanding some uh, uh, complex data, data sets. All right, so you'll have, you know that um, uh, neutrons are uh, affected by magnetic fields. Uh, and what happens is, is that uh, when we pass them, when they travel through a magnetic field, uh, they start to undergo precession. Um, and uh, so, as the neutron passes through the field, its spin starts to process. And so it, and then it, it so if we have a positive field and a negative field uh, that are essentially the same length and the same field strength, then a neutron goes through, will process one way, and then will process back the other way by exactly the same amount. And so uh, the precession, the amount of precession is proportional to uh, the field strength and the distance. Um, what we do in small angle scattering, uh, because we don't have a direct uh, single linear beam, uh, is we actually use these trapezoidal, uh, uh, sorry, parallelogram shaped um, uh, uh, fields. And now what we see is if we send one neutron through, it goes through that much, and then it processes back, and it's completely unchanged on uh, the other end because the unscattered beam gives us this, what we call spin echo of zero. The angular, the difference in the spin between the start and the end condition is zero. Um, and this is independent of height and angle because of the shape of these uh, beams. If we now put a sample in the beam, it will now have a different path length in the second uh, magnetic field from in the first one. And so it will come through uh, with a different spin state at the end than it started with. So the scattering by the sample gives you no complete spin echo and a net precession angle. Um, this uh, gives us a very high resolution, even with a divergent beam. Um, and so we're sensitive to scattering at about three microradians, which is, as I mentioned before, similar to the type of precision we can get from a von Sehart type USANS instrument. Um, so uh, this is now a, a still Fourier transform scattering, um, but a different uh, uh, Fourier transform and gives us the uh, uh, density correlation function. So here we now have 
uh, a decay curve um, that is related to the size of the particles. So where the uh, becomes flat is now directly related to uh, the size of the particles. So in this case, we can effectively read off this scale how big our particles are. So the instrument looks like this. We have a polarizer to polarize our neutron beam to get everything in the same spin state. Uh, to start with, we have a magnet uh, to do uh, the field. Uh, we have a field stepper uh, to uh, control the field. Uh, we have guide fields. We then have an analyzer to analyze the spin state when it comes out and a detector. So how does this relate to normal sands? Uh, and so essentially, in all cases, what we start with is we start with uh, the distribution of density, uh, rho of r. Um, and in the case of uh, regular sands, uh, we have the square of the amplitude of the Fourier transform, and we end up with intensity as a function of q here. Um, in C sands, uh, what we have is we have the able correlation function actually goes here, and we end up with uh, what's known as uh, G of Z, which is the CSANS function. Um, and they're both related then by their respective transforms uh, to uh, gamma of R, which is the pair distance distribution function, which is the actual real space information. However, here the CSANS uses this spin echo length, uh, which means that it is in fact working in real space, uh, a real space length rather than a inverse space uh, length. This technique uh, can be very valuable in cases where you have um, uh, very dense systems where multiple scattering can be a real problem for. Um, uh, the USANS techniques, um, all of our analysis assumes that neutrons are only scattered once when they pass through a sample. Uh, if they're scattered more than once uh, in significant quantities, then that can uh, change the scattering curve in a way that's difficult to analyze uh, or possibly impossible. Um, and so uh, CSANS, it can be used often for systems that are, um, uh, are subject to multiple scattering that would cause problems for a SANS experiment. Um, the, uh, all of this analysis can actually has been built now into SASView. So in SASView, you can analyze both SANS and CSANS in uh, data using the same models. Um, so that has made life a lot easier for people who want to do CSANS uh, experiments. And the places you can do this are at the University of Delft uh, reactor where uh, this was invented. Um, and also uh, at ISIS, uh, where uh, the University of Delft group contributed to building uh, two instruments, Ofspec and LALMOR, which make use of this method. All right, the last method I want to talk to is about doing SANS with an imaging instrument. Um, and so in SANS, what we do is we take a very collimated beam, and we pass it through the sample and we look at the scattering. In imaging, what we do is we take a very divergent beam, uh, shine it on our sample and look at, uh, basically take an image on the detector of what has happened to the intensity of the neutrons. Um, it's possible to set up a set of gratings, um, interference gratings, doing what is known as dark field imaging, where essentially uh, by uh, having a, these diffraction gratings, we can now, and uh, moving them around, uh, we can now do position sensitive uh, small angle scattering of our sample using an imaging detector. Um, and this can allow you, for instance, to look at uh, the distribution of, uh, of small angle scattering within your sample, which can tell you about the distribution of uh, the nanometer uh, to micrometer length scale structure within uh, a sample. Um, and can be a very, uh, um, a uh, powerful technique for certain types of problem. All right, so that uh, overview was really to just make you aware of the fact that there are a whole bunch of methods that exist to extend the, the traditional pinhole SANS measurements. 
to look at structure on much longer length scales, shorter short time scales, um, and to look at surfaces. Um, and these are generally more specialist. I mean, I said that basically everyone has a SANS instrument at their facility. Uh, these types of instruments are very few and far between. Uh, and require generally much more specialist support and planning than a normal SANS instrument. Um, but if uh, you have the right samples, um, these can be very powerful and unique methods for uh, obtaining structural information about. Uh, so I'm happy to have any questions. Uh, I have a question about this uh, time resolved measurement. Yeah. Uh, well, if we do uh, this uh, measurement, I mean, the reaction at the process itself, it's like uh, hours. Mm -hmm. So what would be optimal? At the, uh, so, 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 so Relative long time stop. reaction, so long time reactions like that are actually very easy to measure, uh, depending on, on whether uh, you need very high resolution time in the early phases, say, and less time resolution later. It, it's very uh, variable. But essentially, if you went to an instrument that does uh, event mode recording, you could just start counting data um, and measure for the full hour or so. Um, and then afterwards, choose to slice up the data when you process it uh, into whatever time slices you wanted. Um, otherwise, um, if you don't need very tight resolution, if you only need, say, several seconds resolution, you can just make lots and lots of measurements one after the other while the reaction is happening. Um, and that that works fine. I've done that on 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 samples a lot. Um, and and but it does remain mean you need to know a little bit about the uh, reaction rate in, uh, up front to have an idea about what measurement times you should use. Um, of course, you can always measure with very short measurement times and add the data together afterwards. But that's uh, generally more of a pain than uh, <laughs> than getting it a little bit optimized to start. But those those sort of long times are actually very straightforward to do on a regular sand instrument. Uh, the reason that we try the synchrotron the in situ diffraction measurement yeah. when we charge sample metal sample with hydrogen yeah. in the beginning it's quite fast. I mean yes. uh, within within some minutes it will reach almost a steady state level, but then it will take a long time to real real yeah. <laughs> the yeah. saturation. But uh, well, I don't know what's the optimal. I mean, if we, on just to follow that very initial period, maybe you have to measure quickly. Yeah. So, so, so depending on how quickly quickly is, um, then then measuring on a on a high intensity, the highest intensity beam you can get with uh, an event recording instrument would give you the best possible time resolution um, um, that you could you could choose to to have. Um, the the other thing you can always do with things that then take a long time to equilibrate is you can wait in between. So most instruments have sample changes, right? So, uh, you, so you can measure, measure a sample uh, and then um, uh, switch to the next one and just you know, alternate between them looking at, 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 at intervals in time. You don't have to just keep measuring for those long time equilibration type measurements. You, know, you can may, maybe make some different measurements on some other samples while the other one's equilibrating over time. So there are, there are, there are ways to optimize the measurement time that doesn't mean uh, sitting counting for hours on something that is, isn't changing that fast. Yeah. But yeah, always talk to an instrument scientist. They're, they're, they're used to those type of measurements very much. Yeah. Thank Most you very much. Yeah, great. Good. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, maybe I missed that you said this, uh, but I was wondering about like spin echo sounds. Yes. Like what kind of systems that would be particularly useful for compared to like regular sense? Um, so the um, in general, it's anything where you um, would want to. So so C sands and U sands more or less cover the same size range. Mm -hmm. So so things uh, like emulsions. Um, uh, uh, gels with large scale structure, um, uh, geological samples, um, uh, alloys, where you're looking at grain size structure, grain structure, things like that, um, mm -hmm. where you have these very large structures that, that can't be measured with uh, regular small angle scattering. Um, 
And then with CSANS, um, depending on the setup you have, it can be less sensitive to this multiple scattering problem. Okay. So as you increase the size of particles, obviously the scattering intensity goes up very rapidly and you increase the scattering probability. And this increases then, you know, you have more and more multiple scattering. Uh, and so you get to the point where the scattering signal is too strong. So often for USENS measurements, we actually have to really dial the contrast down to a level where we can actually make the measurement reliably. CSANS is less susceptible to that. And actually CSANS has been used a lot to study things like uh, biological emulsions like milk, cheese, dairy products, um, and so on. Um, I, I did some CSANS to look at the, the structure of very concentrated emulsions um, um, and, and, and um, densely packed uh, mixtures of spheres and things like this. We were looking interested in binary sphere mixing. Um, so in general, anything where there's length scale, there's structure on those length scales. Mm -hmm. um, one nice thing that is now being done on the LAMOR instrument at ISIS is that you can do simultaneous SANS and CSANS. So, so they have a setup whereby the CSANS is actually just measured in the beam stop. So you have the, the center or beam stop measures the CSANS pattern, and then you measure SANS all around it. So you can actually on the same sample measure all the way from a, a few nanometers up to uh, 10 microns. Wow. So um, this is, uh, and that's particularly interesting if you have, uh, for instance, structure that's evolving with time. Yeah. So, so one of the disadvantages of either CSANS on its own or USANS on its own is the fact that they're much slower. Uh, well, CSANS is actually quite fast because it uses the direct beam as well compared to USANS, which is slow because it uses a collimated beam. Um, whereas CSANS can use an uncollimated beam. Um, the, uh, but, but normally you would have to move your sample from one to the other. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're actually interested in the evolution over, of structure over time, where maybe it's a, it's a growth, uh, a nucleation and growth phenomenon or something like this, uh, then you can look at that with, uh, with, with SANS plus CSANS. So, mm -hmm. uh, I can think of an example where maybe, for instance, if you're interested in pickering emulsions, right? Mm -hmm. Particle stabilized emulsions, uh, maybe you're interested in what's happening to the density or amount of stabilizer at the interface over time. And you've started off with a very fine emulsion and it's it's ripening over time. Uh, you can look at how that ripening is potentially look at how that ripening is occurring and look at the distribution of uh, the stabilizer by using um, uh, contrast variation. So, I mean, there, the, but many of these things are things that you would say, well, I can just do that by mostly looking at it. And in fact, I whenever people said they wanted to do USANS experiments, one of the things I would ask them is, have you measured it with every other possible technique first? Because this is going to be a real pain to do, you know, including staring at it very hard, you know. Um, but um, and sometimes the eye is great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, I mean, looking at looking at just you know how something the cloudiness of something is changing or its turbidity will tell you an awful lot uh, before you even need to uh, to do scattering. But um, uh, yeah, so it's those type of systems, um, uh, systems that aren't necessarily amenable to light scattering is usually the ones that are of the interest where you have very dense, yeah. opaque systems. Yeah, where neutrons then also are extra helpful, maybe. Exactly, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. All right, well, thank you, everybody. I hope you have a good rest of the day, and uh, I'll see you in the next couple of days. <laughs>